chapter, we are going to talk about muscular cyst. So first of all, what is muscular cyst? Muscular system is an organ system consisting of skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscle. It permits movement of the body, maintains posture, and circulates blood throughout the body. The muscular system in vertebrates are controlled through the nervous system, although some muscles can be completely autonomous. This topic will be covering main functions of the muscular system and the five major properties, the five types of muscle movement, three types of muscles, and how all of this work together to make up what we know as the muscular system. A scientist long ago dubbed the muscles from the Latin word mus, meaning the little mouse, and the primary purpose of the muscular system is to provide movement of the body. The essential function of muscles is to contract or shorten, a unique characteristic that sets it apart from the other body muscles. As a result of disability, muscles are responsible for all body movements and can be used as the machines of the body. The five major properties of muscular systems are excitable or irritable, contractible, next would be extensible, elasticity, and the last one is adaptability. There are five types of muscle movements, namely, the first type of muscle movement is flexion. It is a movement, generally in the sagittal plane, that decreases the angle of the joint and brings two bones closer together. The second type is extension, the opposite of flexion, so it is a movement that increases the angle or distance between two bones or parts of the body. The third type is rotation. It is a movement of a bone around its longitudinal axis. And the fourth type is abduction, moving in a limb away, generally on the frontal plane from the midline or median plane of the body. And the last type of muscle movements is adduction, which is the opposition of abduction. So it is the movement of a limb towards the body. Let's proceed so. The muscular system is divided into three main types of muscles, and each of these types can be moved by one of two ways, either voluntary or involuntary. Let us first talk about skeletal muscle. These muscles are packaged into organs called skeletal muscles that attach to skeleton and provide the skeleton with the ability to move, also known as serrated muscle because its fibers have obvious stripes and as voluntary muscle because it is only muscle type subject to conscious control. When you think of skeletal muscles, the key words to remember are skeletal, serrated, and voluntary. The second type of muscle is smooth muscle. This muscle is no striations and is involuntary which means that we cannot consciously control it. Found mainly in the walls of hollow tube-like visceral organs such as the stomach, urinary bladder, and respiratory passages, smooth muscles propel substance along a path. And the last type is cardiac muscle. These muscles are found only in one place in the body, the heart, where it forms the bulk of the heart. The heart serves as a pump, propelling body through blood vessels to all body. Important keywords for this muscle type are cardiac, straighted, and involuntary. The trunk muscles include 1. Muscles that move the vertebral column, 2. Anterior thorax muscles which move the ribs, head, and arms, and lastly 3. The muscles of the abdominal wall which hold your guts in by forming a natural girdle and help to move the vertebral column. First, we are going to tackle about the anterior muscle. The anterior muscles of the torso or trunk are those on the front of the body, including the muscles of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. These muscles are the ones with the front of the body that include the chest and abdominal muscles. Chest muscles function in respiration while the abdominal muscles function in torso movement and in maintenance of balance and posture. The muscles of the chest covers the pectoral muscles. Pectoral muscles lie in the chest and exert force through the shoulder to move the upper arm. There are two such muscles on each side of the sternum or breastbone in the human body, which are the pectoralis major and the minor. The second muscle is the intercostal muscle. The intercostal muscles are lying below the pectoral muscles. The intercostal muscles form the chest wall and play a key role in respiration. All intercostal muscles originate on the lower border of their rib and attach to the upper border of the rib. Third is the muscles of the abdominal bird. The anterior abdominal muscles, rectus abdominis, external and internal optics, and transversus abdominis, forming natural girdle that reinforces the body. The muscle is composed of five muscles. First is the external optic, second would be internal optic, third would be the transversus abdominis 
Fourth is the rectus abdominis. Fourth is the posterior muscles. Muscles of the posterior portion of the trunk include muscles of the back, suboccipital region, and cranial region. The posterior back muscles perform a wide range of functions, including movement of the shoulder, head, and neck, as distinct in respiration, posture, and balance. This is composed of two types of muscles. One is the trapezius, second is the latissimus dorsi. Lastly, the quadratus lumborum. The fleshy quadratus lumborum muscles form part of the posterior abdominal. This includes the deltoid muscle. The deltoid muscles are fleshy, triangle-shaped muscles that form the rounded shape of your shoulder. The region of each deltoid vein across the shoulder girdle from the spine of the scapula to the clavicle. It inserts into proximal humerus, and the deltoid are the prime movers of the abdomen. Let's proceed to the muscles of upper limb. The upper limb muscles fall into three groups. The first group includes muscles that arise from the shoulder girdle and cross the shoulder joint to insert into the humerus. The second group causes movement of the elbow joint. These muscles enclose the humerus and insert on the forearm bones. The third group of upper limb muscles includes the muscles of the forearm which insert on the hand bones and cause their movement. The muscles of the last group are thin and spindle shaped. All anterior muscles of the numerous cause elbow flexion. In order of decreasing strength, these are the brachials, biceps brachii, and brachioradialis. One, biceps brachii is the most familiar muscle of the arm because it bulges when you flex your elbow. Second, brachialis lies deep to the biceps brachii and, like the biceps, is a prime mover in elbow flexion. The brachialis lifts the ulna as the biceps lift the radius. Third would be the bronchioradialis. It is a fairly weak muscle that arises on the humerus and inserts into the distal forearm. Fourth would be the triceps brachiae. It is the only muscle flushing out the posterior humerus. Muscles of the lower limb that causes movement of the kidney and foot. They are the largest, strongest muscles in the body and are specialized for walking and balancing the body. As the pelvic girl is composed of heavy fused bones that allow little movement, no special group of muscles is necessary to stabilize. First would be the gluteus maximus. It is a superficial muscle of the hip that forms most of the flesh of the bottom. It is a powerful hip extensor that acts to bring the thigh into a straight line with the pelvis. Second is the gluteus minimus, which runs from the ilium to the femur beneath the gluteus maximus for most of its length. The gluteus medius is a hip abductor and it is important in studying the pelvis during walking. The third would be the iliopsoas. It is a fused muscle composed of two muscles, the iliacus and the psoas major. It runs from the iliac bone and the lower vertebrae and deep inside the pelvis to insert on the lesser trochanter of the back. Common primary muscle disorders include inflammatory myopathies including polymyositis which is characterized by inflammation and progressive weakening of the skeletal muscles. Dermatomycosis, which is polymyositis, is accompanied by a screen rush and inclusion body myositis, which is characterized by progressive muscle weakness and wasting. Other common disorders are muscular dystrophies and metabolic muscle disorders. A term to also remember is muscular dystrophy, which affects specific muscle groups. Metabolic muscle disorders interfere with the chemical reactions involved in growing energy from food. Neuromuscular disorders affect the nerves that control voluntary muscles and the nerves that communicate sensory information back to the brain. Nerve cells or neurons send and receive electrical messages to and from the body to help control voluntary muscles. When the neurons become unhealthy or die, communication between the nerve system and muscles breaks down. As a result, muscles weaken and waste the rather attractive. Symptoms. There are many neuromuscular disorders and treatment with experienced multidisciplinary things such as the one of the Southern United Neuromuscular Disorders Program. It is vital. These disorders result in muscle weakness and fatigue that progress over time. Some neuromuscular disorders have symptoms that begin in infancy, while others may appear in childhood or even adult. Symptoms will depend on the type of neuromuscular disorder and the areas of the body that are affected. Some symptoms common to neuromuscular disorders include muscle weakness that can lead to twitching, cramps, aches, and pain, muscle loss, movement issues, balance problems, numbness, tingling, or painful sensations, 
puffy eyelid, double vision, trouble swallowing, and last, trouble breathing. Before we end this chapter, we get to have an overview to the things that we are about to learn for the next lesson. As we all know, it all focuses on practice as we have to understand for the subject of anatomy and physiology. To end it, here is a quote from Ruth Gordon that says, Courage is very important.